your very own treasure hunt. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet? Holy cow! Can you believe we're seeing the ninth generation of mainline Pokemon games? That's crazy, right? And that's a weed kitty. Assuming this video comes out when I'm planning, the billionth Pokemon games, Pokemon Scarlet and Pokemon Violet, come out today. Or, if you're watching this in the future, it came out on the day that this was posted. Hi, future friend. Have I hit a billion subscribers yet? Pokemon as a franchise has been around almost as long as I've been alive. And if you weren't aware, I'm an old man. A crotchety millennial who hurts himself in his sleep. I was there when Pokemon was released on our shores, and I've seen the franchise grow into the humongous cultural touchstone that it is today. An impressive feat, to be sure. Pokemon is timeless, and keeps rushing forward with no end in sight. So, approaching the release of this newest generation of Pokemon games, I can't help but think, why? 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 Why are they still so successful after all of these years? How have they managed to garner such a lasting audience? And I know there are a ton of potential answers to this. It's a big question that could take a look at a lot of elements and crunch a whole lot of data. Their ability to tap into each new market of children born, the diversification of types of media Pokemon inhabits now, you get the idea. And honestly, we could probably sum all of that into a big casual, Pokemon is just cool, man. But I want to narrow the focus a bit. There's a piece of Pokemon's audience what I would wager is a fairly large piece of the whole pie, in fact, that's been on my mind lately. The aging millennials who have fallen out of rabid fandom, but are still there at every release picking up the new gen. The kids who aren't kids anymore. And wow, their backs hurt, but they're still loading up their Nintendo and trying to catch them all. It's me. I'm those kids. And today, as I get ready to sit down with a new region and new Pokemon, I want to take a look back through the history of Pokemon leading up to Scarlet and Violet through the eyes of one particular tired and sore old man and answer the question, why did I buy yet another Pokemon game? And for that, we're going to need to travel back to 1998. So my parents divorced in 1996, the year that Pokemon came out in Japan. Coincidence? Who's to say? Fast forward two years, and I've got a routine of sorts going. I mean, I think. Like anyone, my memory of childhood is a little fuzzy. But a lot of memories of Pokemon burned bright as touchstones in my life. So, hey, that's cool, I guess. Anyway, we have a routine. Split households, my parents are very cordial with each other, and trying to be the most supportive parents possible. And at some point, I have obtained a Game Boy Pocket. I can't remember where I heard about Pokemon or how I knew I needed them, but at some point I got Pokemon Red and holy shit, everything changed. I was pouring myself into this game and I'm sure the few kids my own age I knew were also playing and I wanted to make sure I wasn't falling behind the Joneses, but I knew Red was so cool and that there was a blue one and I bet that one was also so cool and different and I had to have that too, of course. Google wasn't there to bail me out of this one, okay? So I find myself in a situation where one parent has bought me red, one has bought me blue, I load up blue, leaving red for a little bit, and lo and behold, it's the same f***ing game. And this leads me to the first huge personal crisis I ever remember having in my life. I was an awful son who had begged for something I already basically had. How could I face my parents and tell them that one of them had wasted their precious money? I couldn't. So I resolved not to tell them that there was basically no difference, and also resolved to play each game equally and devote the same amount of love and attention to each, thereby honoring each parent. <laughs> Shout out to all the other kids that divorced in the audience, you know what I'm talking about. And sure, as time went on, it became a boon to have both. And I made friends with people who had link cables and knew about game-specific Pokemon differences. And I had a friend whose uncle worked at Nintendo and knew how to get the Mew out from under that truck. Oh, and quick aside, regarding Mew, sorta, I was gonna have a longer section in here about the first movie and going with my friends, but I couldn't make it work. Didn't feel like it fit in the overall narrative of this video. But 
I did want to take a second to just say, holy moly, that movie devastated me. I cried in the theater at, at that scene. I cried when it came out on VHS and we bought it. And I cry every time I even see the clip of that scene to this day. What a movie. So fast forward a bit and the world is in straight up Pokemon fever. The anime is out, which I become obsessed with. I woke up extra early before going to school so I could watch it on TV. And I knew the song. I learned the whole rap. And I idolized Ash Ketchum and his resolve. I mean, like, he was pretty cool back then, man. And speaking of obsessing over things, they made a trading card game for this thing. And let me tell you, it pushed all of Young Joe's buttons. Pokemon cards became a constant in my life. There was something about opening the packs, organizing the cards, putting them into their binder pages and keeping them pristine that really spoke to me. And I was going to school at this point, a, a Christian school that turned out to be an awful, awful place. So I got to be surrounded by other kids who were super into Pokemon like me. We traded cards and played the games before school, at recess, after school, in class. And of course, like almost every school of the era, Pokemon cards got banned. They tried to link it to some sort of Pokemon or the devil thing, but I'm convinced it was just to stop all the moms calling the school and complaining about Taylor ripping their child off in bad trades. Speaking of, screw you Taylor, I want my Charizard back. I have so many fuzzy, fond memories of Pokemon in this period of my life. My dad would bring Japanese packs back for me from his business trips to San Francisco. My friend Will and I would stay up organizing cards, playing on the Game Boy, and talking about which Pokemon would beat which in a fight. And I never actually learned how to play the card game either. Not until I was in my mid-twenties, and one of my best friends and I got into it because he was starting a Pokemon club at the school he taught in. But the opening and collecting was enough. I'd flip through my binders of cards, devouring the art and imagining all of the potential the Pokemon on them had. Most of my old collection is long gone, unfortunately, sold to feed my eventual Magic the Gathering addiction. But I have a little binder of my favorites from back in the day. And a Slowpoke binder, where I keep all of my Slowpokes. And I still buy the occasional Pokemon card pack to this day at the store just to smile and flip through for a while. Okay, hey, before I get into talking about Pokemon Yellow, and also tell one of the most embarrassing stories I've ever shared on the internet, or, or anywhere, really, I just want to say thank you for still being here. If you haven't, it would mean a lot to me if you hit that subscribe button. Super helps the channel out. Okay, so let's fast forward a bit. I now have a lime green Game Boy Color, and I desperately want Pokemon Yellow. I think it had been out a bit, but I didn't have a good outlet for video game news or ads, except for the few friends who were more plugged in than I was, but I convinced my mom that I deserved a copy. And instead of going to a store, we'd order it online for some reason. Maybe we couldn't find it, but th this was a very new thing you could do. We had the screaming modem and the giant gray monitor and everything, and shipping takes forever. But I vigilantly wait for the package. We finally get it, and I'm beside myself. I've been looking forward to this forever, and I'm so excited to play the game where Pikachu follows you around. My mom and I rip into the box. She's excited too. This is a big, awesome mom moment after all. And what do we find inside? A copy of Pokemon Blue. I'm instantly defeated crushed. I remember trying to hold back the worst of my disappointment for my mom, but I'm sure I didn't do a good job. I was probably a sobbing mess by the end of the whole ordeal. And my poor mom goes into fix-it mode. She's going to return it, and she's going to find the right version and make it all okay. Like I said, this is the early years of the internet. This was an enormous task she embarks on, but she gets it sorted with the seller and finds someone who actually has a copy of yellow version and we wait for it to be delivered. And we wait. And we wait. Something must have happened with a delay or a missed delivery or something because weeks and weeks go by. I've given up hope and kind of forgotten all about it. I'm content with the games I do have and you know, you're a kid, life goes on. Then one day, I'm getting dropped off at my house after school by the family I carpooled with at the time, and there's a giant butcher paper sign taped to my mom's garage. 
I should mention, my mom was an art major back in the day, and she's drawn an intricate, badass sign with the words, it's here, across it in bubble letters. It took me a minute to process what the sign was talking about, but oh my god, when I pieced it together, I was ecstatic. I'm pretty sure I happy cried this time around. Finally, my game was here. And boy howdy, did I get obsessed with yellow. I was glued to that thing constantly. And it got so bad that... Okay, I, I'm not sure why on earth I actually wrote this into the script. This is an incredibly embarrassing story to tell on the internet or anywhere. And uh, skip to the next chapter marker if bodily functions gross you out significantly. Okay, but yeah, I would practically never put my Game Boy down at this point. I'd even take it in the bathroom on occasion, hold it with one hand while I peed, and move on with my day, grinding away at the game. And then one day, the predictable happens. My clumsy ass drops the Game Boy, and I watch it slow-mo drop through my active pee stream into the bowl full of yellow pee water. My beautiful lime green Game Boy with yellow version in it, now extra yellow and my little kid brain breaks and I start screaming for my mom all I remember is her practically kicking the door in figuring out what happened and bless her heart she reaches her damn hand right into the bowl and yanks the game boy out dries it off and puts it on our dehumidifier and the darn thing kept working we cleaned it up, sanitized it, and I was right back on my journey to catch them all, Pikachu in tow. I still have that Game Boy, and before I packed it up for a move, it was still working. It's still being stored, or I'd pull it out and prove it to you. And the moral of these Pokemon Yellow stories? My mom kicks ass and always has. If you're watching this, Ma, love you. Can't wait to see you on Thanksgiving. The next big chunk of Pokemon life is extra fuzzy for me. I eventually became less obsessed with Pokemon as the years progressed. I got older, like you do, got into other things, made non-gamer friends, started a band, yada yada. However, that's not to say that Pokemon wasn't a part of my life. Because it's always been a constant. I may have missed the advanced era of games somehow, which some of my friends tell me is basically a crime, but I had a DS and have bought at least one of the games of the current generation ever since then. Maybe with a few exceptions, but I'm pretty sure I didn't miss any. Even when it wasn't my obsession, I'd pause life for a little bit and go back to the world that used to bring me so much comfort, revisiting the obsession, if even just for a little while. Pokemon has always seemed to be that constant presence in my life. There, just when I needed it. Speaking of being there just when I needed it, we're gonna fast forward a bit more where we find old MTG Joe D falling into the dark times. I was going back to college and not doing very great at it. I'd just gone through losing most of my friends, I was living back at home with my dad, and to be honest, mental health was at a big all-time low. My childhood best friend, Will, who I talked about in the earlier sections a bit, came back from college and reintroduced me to Magic the Gathering. And just hold on to your horses, I promise this ties back into Pokemon, but he gets me good and hooked on Magic, right? And I find myself frequenting my local game store, shout out Phoenix Fire Games, playing in tournaments, and slowly accumulating a super awesome group of friends. And turns out most of them still play the video games. One of them, in particular, even used to be one of the best Pokemon TCG players on my side of the country. Like big top dog, winning all sorts of stuff, and just crushing it at the game. Funnily enough, that's actually how he got into Magic. Flipping a lot of his Pokemon prizes into modern MTG staples, which his big modern collection ended up being the reason I was as successful as I was at that point in my magic life, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, bing bang boom, Bob's your uncle, I'm burying myself in Pokemon Y with guidance from my buddy, and I hit it hard. It turns out the repetitiveness of breeding Pokemon hits Joe's depressed brain just right, and I decided I had to breed the perfect competitive Slowbro for my competitive VGC team because Slowpoke 
is the best Pokemon ever, and if you don't believe me, I have a whole essay on that that you can watch after this. If you don't know what breeding Pokemon is like in the games, basically you put two Pokemon with traits you want together in a daycare and make them make you eggs. Lots and lots and lots and lots of eggs, which you then have to carry with you while you ride around in little circles on your bicycle in the game until they hatch. Rinse and repeat. And boy, did I hatch a lot of slowpokes from those eggs. Like, my depressed ass sat there and filled up almost every single possible slot in my boxes with slowpokes. Which, bright side, was how I got my first ever shiny. And it was my favorite Pokemon to boot. Much to my friend's chagrin, I'm sure, I didn't even really get that far into finishing a competitive team, or battling, or anything. Really. Sorry, Adam. But I was able to lose myself in a time where getting lost was pretty necessary. And I'm super thankful to him for helping me find my way back into those games when I needed it. And also for being there when things got real dark. Dude is a legend. Eventually, I fell out of that, but I played through Sun and Moon alongside him, which is about when we briefly got involved again with the competitive TCG. And then when Sword and Shield came out, I picked those up too. Because of course I did. That's the thing. A new Pokemon is out, you buy it. That's just how it works. And I know that the community at large seemed to loathe those games, at least according to Twitter and the sensational YouTube headlines I read, but I loved playing through them. I had a blast. It was great to be able to put life on pause for a bit again and play through the story. And then coincidentally, life got really hard again. And I got lost in trying to breed shinies obsessively for a few months, which was actually super fun. And I did manage to do a little competitive battling this time around. I emerged from the depression funk and I went on with life. And life kept going on. At some point during that story, I played Let's Go, and I enjoyed that. And I got the Diamond remake and played part of it and forgot until the beginning of this week, actually. At the time I'm writing this, I think I have like two badges left. And then Arceus came out, and oh, damn. You better believe I pre-ordered that and played it for a week straight before abandoning it, because adult life is a never-ending cycle of despair and commuting. For the record, I thought Arceus was sweet. Work just got extra nuts and I lost track of where I was. But I do plan on going back to it at some point, after Scarlet and Violet. And that, my friends, is a very personal look at the history of Pokemon through the eyes of a singular example of one of many demographics that the Pokemon company has managed to cultivate. I've bought at least one copy of almost every mainline Pokemon game since release. I occasionally buy the cards and other random merch. And my girlfriend got me a Slowpoke plush at the fair that I stare at fondly as he sits atop my shelf. And yeah, sometimes I cuddle it. I haven't even completely finished a Pokemon game in years. But here I sit, trying to decide ahead of time if I want to roll up with a weird duck, a toothy alligator, or an adorable weed kitty. So why did I buy into Pokemon Scarlet and Violet? Well, when it all comes down to it, I think I bought it for that little kid, crying for joy when he saw the sign his mom taped up to the garage. This one's for you, bud. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for going on this trip down Pokemon memory lane with me. Uh, um, if you're playing the new games, which starter did you go with? Let me know in the comments. I'm obviously going with the cat, because, duh. I want to take a second to thank my patrons. I love you all so much, and your belief in me is sometimes one of the only things that keeps me going when I lose faith in myself creatively. I apologize I had writer's block for so long, and I promise to come out with a new video sooner than last time. Hopefully, maybe. If you like my stuff and want me to make more, consider throwing a dollar a month at me over on Patreon if you can. It really helps. And if not, no worries at all. I'm just glad you're here. Maybe send this video to a friend of yours that likes Pokemon. YouTube should be showing you a video of mine it thinks you'd like right now. It's most likely my Slowpoke essay. Go well, click over onto that if you want another video to watch. And take care out there, friend.
Okay, love you, bye.